we'd like to welcome everybody who's uh, who's watching out there uh, through the Huntsman YouTube channel. Um, my name is uh, Chris Corcoran. I'm a professor of data analytics here in the Huntsman School at Utah State University. So excited to have uh, Derek White with us from Google. Um, Derek and I are both uh, Utah State alums. And so it's, it's a pleasure to be able to, to talk today. Derek, do you wanna just uh, maybe take a moment to kind of introduce yourself, uh, talk about um, your Utah State experience and, and when you lived here and, and, and so on before we get started? You betcha. Um, thank you, Dr. Corcoran. It's a privilege to be with you. Hello, Aggies. It's great to be back. Uh, I wish I was physically on campus. I will be in Logan in two weeks time for my son's lacrosse tournament. Uh, and we've been back to Logan a, a number of times uh, in the last uh, year and a half. But uh, it, it, it really is great to, to be back with you and share some thoughts with you. Uh, as, as I was once a student at Utah State and fondly remember my time walking the quad, being on campus, lived uh, uh, um, just off of 10th North um, uh, in J4. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so my background is, uh, and I, I would also, before I get started, I would say my parents went to Utah State, three of my four siblings went to Utah State, so we're Aggies uh, through and through, and my parents met on Old Main Hill ice blocking uh, back in the day. Uh, so my background is uh, both my parents are educators, and that's been, had a huge influence on my life. My father was uh, 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 an administrator uh, for many years at different universities and then worked at Snow College for almost 20, 25 years. Mom was an educator uh, and, and teacher of um, elementary students. Um, and I always thought, that, and when I was at Utah State, I thought that I was going to go on and get a PhD. So I got a degree in liberal arts and sciences. My father had, my dad had looked at it and, and understood that it would keep options open if I wanted to go into law, if I wanted to go into business. A multidisciplinary degree at, uh, at Utah State University was uh, was uh, positioned for that. So I got a degree in liberal arts and sciences and a minor in management um, and and Norwegian language. Uh, and uh, loved my time at, at Utah State uh, while there. Not just the class uh, learnings was fantastic. Um, the uh, social life uh, was incredible. The outdoor location, uh, Dr. Corker and I were talking about how magical Logan is, just as a destination and one of the best places on the planet. But then also it was, it was a real catalyst uh, for my career and I can come on to that um, as to how I started a, a small business there with my roommate, working with the uh, Student Alumni Association uh, that paid for college was an incredible business and was a catalyst for my career. But yeah, tell um, us a little bit about that, Derek. What was that business and, and uh, how, how, <clears throat> how did it kind of teach you about what, what it was that you wanted to do later on? Yeah, so uh, Patty Halafia was at the, uh, at, at the, um, in the Alumni Association. My brother had um, helped, he and Patty kind of were the catalyst for, for restarting the Student Alumni Association at Utah State University in 1995. Uh, to build connection between alumni and students. And, um, and as part of that, being the younger brother, I got dragged into it. And I didn't know what I was getting into, but I, I thought uh, my big brother was, in, it was uh, part of this student association. It sounded interesting. So um, sitting in, in, uh, in, in one of the student alumni meetings, um, Carlos, the head of the alumni association, mentioned, hey, listen, We've just signed a deal with a, um, uh, a credit card company to issue the Utah State University visa card. And they're looking for students to help promote that visa card. And immediately in my mind, I had this image of some person standing behind a table hawking credit cards. And I was like, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna do that. And, um, and so it went through one meeting and then Carlos came back the next meeting and says, listen, do you gonna know anybody that might be interested in doing this? And I said, well, um, I learned a little bit more about it. And he says, uh, the compensation, you get paid for every application that you generate. I was like, okay, let me think about that. So then I went home and um, <clears throat> talked with my roommate and we're like, we could do this. 
we could just you know set this up and and we, we ended up setting up a little business that promoted the utah state university credit card on campus um and that led to us building up a uh a, a marketing little marketing company um and then uh we were awarded the best sales reps in the nation by by what is now jp morgan chase wow um and as part of that uh, was uh, then recruited to go back to work for them. And my job, my first job out of college was to help uh, help set up marketing at uh, college campuses, sporting events all over the all over the United States. And I had what I thought when I left Utah State, I wasn't married. And I thought I had the greatest single guy's job on the planet. I got paid to go to sporting events. <laughs> to meet with the executives of the teams, to meet the players of the teams, and to run teams of a couple hundred people setting up tables and marketing materials and giving away free LA Dodgers, Portland Trail Blazers, Miami Dolphins, uh, US Tennis, Pro Bull Riders uh, events. And so I spent three, three plus years traveling the United States um, and going to events, uh, attending events, uh, as a sports lover, it was a dream, okay, and I was there, doing. Now you've just now you've just made me aware of my one big regret as a Utah State student because you and I graduated as undergrads about the same we time. Did. How did I we not? Did. How did I not know about this? I mean, well, you, I would, you, you you may remember walking it. You may remember walking into the into the bookstore. We only have yes. one bookstore on campus. And we realized there was a strategic funnel of students and, and parents and alumni with, that would either come to the store or to the bookstore. So we, I, I, I got the, my, the Carlos, the, uh, uh, the head of the Alumni Association, to get write me an excuse to, from my classes <laughs> the first two weeks. We set up a table. We got our friends and our girlfriends, and we had a table set out there. We gave away free Utah State T-shirts to anybody that would sign up, and, and we killed it. It was, it was fantastic. That is awesome. If I had known that that was uh, that, that that opportunity was, if if I could have just like I said, if I could have just carried your luggage or something like that for the next few years after we graduated, that'd be awesome. I, you know, uh, that that is really fascinating because I, I was kind of wondering how it was that you you know uh, how you found that path to J.P. Morgan back in Delaware after you graduated. So that 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 kind of explains that bridge, but. But, but tell me, you know, you had been thinking about um, at that point, maybe another kind of degree, either like you yeah, said, yeah, 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 degree. And, and you actually did end up getting your MBA at Wharton eventually. Uh, tell me about how, a, a little bit about how that experience, I guess, uh, as an entrepreneur when you were a student kind of shaped your, your goals immediately so quickly after graduation. I mean, what... I, I, I would imagine that it was kind of an exciting time, a, a very dynamic time, but, but tell me a little bit about how that kind of quickly shaped your, your, your Yeah, your, and, and, and it, it sounds maybe, uh, we're focusing on all the highlights of this. I think what, what is, is interesting is I graduated, I didn't have a job. I, I, I had three offers when I graduated. One was to do uh, quality control for Pizza Hut and PepsiCo and in a region uh, in, in the Western US. I had a job from um, a paint company to run a paint store. And then I had a couple of others that the, that the uh, alumni network had helped uh, explore, but it, it wasn't anything that just felt right for me. So I actually left Utah State. I moved back to my parents' house in Ephraim. I built houses for six months and I took a couple of extra classes at Snow College while I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, because I was going to get an MBA. I was going to go on and get, a, get an MBA. But that was before I moved back to the East Coast, and, and I was still running this, this little business with my, with my, uh, with my roommate. Um, but the, the path back to uh, the running a business at Utah State and, um, uh, was incredibly um, an incredible learning experience in um, logistics, um, in interpersonal relations, in sales, in the simplicity of articulating a message, all of that came, and how to work with people, all of that came out of uh, this small business that we had set up at Utah State because 
in order for us to grow the business, we had to plan ahead of time when the event was. And then there was a lot of event, event planning associated with that is making sure that we had the premiums that we were going to give away, that we had the app, paper application form. Because back in the day, uh, everything was done on a, on a paper application. There was making sure that the, the staff that we had hired showed up to the event. Um, and bringing it all together uh, was, was um, a learning experience. I'll never forget the very first day we did it was Aggie Day on the quad. We set up a pop-up tent. We had um, 750 Coleman coolers that had been shipped in from uh, what was, it was First USA that became uh, JP Morgan Chase. And they said, there's no way you'll, there's no way you'll do 750 applications in the entire day. And so we set up on the quad in 90 minutes, they were gone. And I, and I'll remember calling naively. I remember calling uh, the bank contact and said, Hey, can you get us some more coolers? I just thought, you know, they could just ship, get some more to Logan in no problem. No, t in no time. And uh, logistically that wasn't possible. So making sure that we had sufficient supply real time to bring the goods to the customer in, in a market was a real learning experience. So, so tell me, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you know, you, you built houses, you did some different things, I guess, before you, before you, uh, kind of seize that opportunity that ultimately, uh, kind of shaped your path, but, um, you know, reflect that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing you reflect a little bit about how that, how, how those experiences, you know, having, having to really kind of work hard, um, uh, and, um, and, you know, uh, I, I guess uh, work at some jobs that that maybe were a little more manual and so on. I mean, how how did those kinds of experiences kind of help shape your your attitude um, uh, about your future? And and how did the how did those kinds of experiences benefit you? I I, I think it was just instilled from my parents from the day I grew up uh, um, in the way I was raised. Um, uh, academics were always important in our household. Um, academics over athletics uh, was a was a priority. Both my again, both my parents were educators. Uh, Dad would wake us up at six o'clock in the morning every morning. And we'd have some kind of uh, um, uh, scripture study. But then my dad is is was trained in organizational behavior. He worked with Steve Covey at BYU, and so. And in the, in the morning at 6.30 in the morning, imagine this as a, as a sophomore in high school, I'd wake up at 6.30 in the morning. My dad would be pumping us with positive motivational thoughts on <laughs> you can do this, but in order to do it, you got to, and, and it was everybody from Zig Ziglar to Steve Covey to you name it. We were getting positive motiva motivational thoughts that maybe you're growing up in Ephraim, Utah. We'd lived in other places. You may be growing up in Ephraim, Utah, which is 2000 people because that's where my parents had chosen to live but the world is your oyster and that you can do anything that you want. And having that instilled in me at a, at an age was, was in, incredibly, incredibly important. But then associated with that was a, an importance of a humility of understanding that you have to work in order to do it. So many of my jobs when I was in high school and college were, were custodian jobs. Um, and then I got, got into finding this and, and building a business. And I realized that based on the amount of effort, there was a, in this, in that first job, that first role, there was a direct multiplier of effort. You could see the effort translated directly into uh, compensation. Um, and that was, that was, uh, that was pretty profound. But um, I, I was always motivated by um, being very good at whatever it is I do. And I take great pride today in being world class in something. And it took me a long time to figure out what it is, right? I wasn't one of those athletes that was the best athlete. I was a, I was a good student, um, but um, uh, it took me some time to figure out really who I was and what I wanted to become. And so I knew I needed to work at it in order to get there. Um, thanks, uh, I, I'm curious. Uh, um... What, what were some of uh, the classes that you took at Utah State? Like, are there one or two that stick out or a couple of professors that really had a profound influence on you? Yeah, the, the, um, uh, there were a number of classes, uh, everything from business law 
to uh, uh, management, to marketing, to uh, um, sociology. Sociology was probably one of the classes where I learned the most, just for me, because I had I had more of a kind of engineering mindset, very numbers oriented. Numbers came very, very, very easy to me uh, from the time I was young. Um, and sociology had a pretty profound impact that I can get into uh, as to how it understanding the human element and understanding I hadn't appreciated how unique everybody is in that I, I had been searching for the formula for success. And I thought that there was one formula. And I had seen others that were successful and we all, I think we all do that, especially now in the age of social media. It's easy, it's easy to look at the great things that other people are doing and, and, um, and perhaps project, try and project that on ourselves. But um, sociology, my sociology professor, I'll never forget, he asked us to write a, a, a paper and I chose one of my favorite music groups was Rush. And I chose a Rush song and I dissected that Rush song because it what, had meaning. What song was it, by the way? Free Will. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, and, and I took the, the words in that song and it was all, everything that was going on in the class and the thinking on the class and how every human individual is unique and different, right? Um, at the age of 18, my dad had me do my first uh, MBTI test uh, or Myers-Briggs test to start to understand who I am as an individual and as a person. And so I was on, on this kind of quest of understanding who I am and what does success look for like for Derek White. And I, I didn't know what that looked like, but the sociology class really helped me understand that everybody's unique and different and that there isn't one formula and that that formula for success is different for everybody because everybody has unique talents and gifts, right? And I, I now refer to it as magic. What is my magic? My magic is very different from Dr. Corcoran's magic. It's gonna be different from every one of you as students. And that's really, really important. And as I talk with, with young emerging talent all over the world, I, I, I have the privilege in my job of traveling all over the world. And I've worked in every, every, every region of the world now. And whether visiting um, people in, in Barclays Bank in Ghana or Kenya or Zimbabwe or South Africa or BBVA in, in uh, Peru, Chile, Argentina or Mexico, or other regions of the world. My favorite meeting out of, uh, out of any meeting that I have with executives or, or, or customers is a meeting with young students or ro top rising talent. And I'll set up a breakfast or a lunch and we'll go into that meeting and they're thinking they're gonna come in and talk to an executive. And I start the meeting off by saying, we're not talking about banking, we're not talking about technology, we're gonna talk about life. And we start the meeting off with each person saying, who are you? Where do you come from and what's your magic? And the key principle that I hope to instill in these sessions is that who you are is important and understanding for you to be a leader anywhere in any capacity, uh, in any role, it's really important. The first element of leadership is understanding who you are and what makes you who you are. The second is where you're from and where you're from influences what you have become today. Like I have described the influence of my parents, my upbringing influences who I am, but it does not predict who I am or what I will become. And the third element is what's your magic and understanding what your magic is. And, and there are amazing surprises that come out of these sessions where I've met a 55 year old engineer in, in the United Kingdom sitting in a pub and she said that her magic is setting world records as the world's hang gliding champion. 55 year old engineering woman. I would have never guessed it. Another, another guy says that his, his magic is bell chiming, not bell ringing, but bell chiming. He's the guy that goes and chimes the bells at weddings. And that's what he loves to do. Another guy loves to bring his love of Star Wars and children together. And he dresses up at Darth Vader and he goes and visits hospitals. And that's his magic. And the more that we recognize who we are, where we've come from, what makes Derek unique, what makes Chris unique. I wish I knew the students on the under the end of the day, then I'd use your names. What makes you unique? What is your magic? And how do you leverage that magic 
to become the individual that you can become and to have the impact in society, in your homes, in your individuals, uh, in, in, in your individual life. Um, that's really important to understand what your magic is. Do, do you mind uh, just maybe sharing uh, how you feel about yourself, what your magic is? Uh, yeah, it's taken me some time, but um, I, I've, I've learned that my magic is, uh, it comes down to two words. Um, sorry, my screen just went on screensaver. Give me one second. Uh, my magic is connecting and creating. My parents will tell you, I was a super social kid in, in, in high school. I didn't realize it, but I need social interaction with people. Now understand, my parents are educators. My brother, my big brother, my hero, eight, uh, just one year and 19 days older than I am. He's the chief of staff at Dixie State University today. Um, uh, and he was, my, he was my example. My parents were love reading. My brother loved consuming and learning through reading. I hate reading. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy reading books. My, I don't have the attention span for it. You might guess that from my energy, but I don't have that attention span that, that sticks through books. And, so, and I, take, I took great, great energy from learning about Richard Branson, the super successful entrepreneur that has dyslexia and he doesn't enjoy reading. It's like, oh my gosh, there's somebody like me out there, right? So what I found that even in high school, my house was the destination where people came and I found that I connected people. And that's a big part of what I do today. And I've taken that from not just connecting people, but how I connect, connect friends socially. But I naturally within an organization, whether it's leading tens of thousands of people that have reported to me or working with my peers or working and leading a 140,000 person organization, it's about connecting people. And, 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 and I can come on to the principles of leadership associated with that. The second is that I'm a creator. You know, one of the biggest things that in business school was was instilled in us and in, in many organizations is own a PL. Own a PL or run an organization. And I've been given lots of opportunities to do that. But there are elements of running an organization that that for me can become boring. I'm very much more interested in understanding creating the future on how do you take insights from what's happening out in, in markets, in the ecosystem, with technology, with human behavior changes, and how do you translate that into new products and services and create, that's what I love to do. I'm a creator and a connector. Uh, that might be more color than you're asking for, Dr. No, Kirkland. not at all. I, I think, that's I think, my magic. Yeah, I think that's really helpful because, uh, you know, you, you can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like part of what you're saying is, uh, you know, I, I know that this sounds kind of like a cliche, but, but be true to your own, the, the things that you love and the things that you're good at, because I, you know, obviously we live in a world that's a lot more interconnected electronically, but we may feel like we have to be, we have to have the same magic as somebody else. Um, and, 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 you know, what, what you've expressed to us is a good example of how you have to find what's unique about you, that you, you didn't have the same affinities maybe as in, in some ways as your parents or your brother. And, and, uh, and so you found, you know, you, you found what you enjoyed and you leveraged that, you know, to, to make a difference, to make an impact. So, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the students who are out here listening, who are thinking about this, who are thinking about, you know, what's my magic, um, what advice would you give to them about, about finding that? Uh, it, it, it takes uh, stretch yourself, try new experiences, try things, get perspective. You know, if you stand at if you stand at the top of Bryce Canyon, you get one perspective. If you go down to the down to the base of Bryce Canyon, if you hike down into the Bryce Canyon, you get a very different perspective. If you grew up in Logan, Utah, or if you grew up in Hiram, or if you grew up in Ephraim, like I did with 96 students graduating in my graduating class from Manti High School. That's one perspective. If you grew up in Kenya or Zimbabwe, that's a different perspective. And one of the greatest things that I can suggest is to get experience. And that's one of the things my dad pushed me towards when I was, when I was trying to figure out what job should I take as my first job out of college? 
I put undue pressure on myself, trying to find that perfect job that was the right thing as the catalyst for me in my career. And, uh, and I would suggest getting perspective and experience especially is, is one of the most valuable things. Put yourself in different environments. If you're an introvert, put yourself in an, in an environment that is more extroverted. If you're an extrovert, then put yourself in an environment that's more introverted and understand what it is that makes people different. Because one of the principles of leadership that I firmly believe in is understanding what you are and who you are, but also understanding who you are not. And I will tell you, I'm not funny. I'm not a natural comedian. I'm not one of those people where humor just comes naturally to me. And when there's an intense situation, you crack the perfect joke at the right time, whether it's a family situation or a, a meeting at the office or a disagreement. And then that just lacing in of humor at the right time, you know, you know who those people are. They have that gift. I don't have that gift. But I have three friends that are my closest friends because I get overly intense and I'm like focused on building and execution and driving and getting things done. I have a wife and I have kids and I have three friends that my three close friends that I have worked with for 22 years that compliment me for what I am not. And it's really important to understand. And you don't have to have a perfect definition. We learn through this. It's part of our life journey. But asking yourself those questions of who you are, who you aren't, what your magic is and what your magic isn't. How do you surround yourself with people that aren't just like you, but compliment you? Yeah, it, that uh, that's an interesting point because it sounds like part of what you're saying is, you know, part of understanding what you're not is is being able to appreciate the magic in other people. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, do, do you have any reflections about how you, you know, in a leadership position, how you help the people around you? to identify their magic. I, I mean, I would imagine, you know, we all run into a lot of people from day to day who maybe don't even appreciate exactly what it is that they're contributing. I mean, how do you as a leader help people to find that, that magic and, 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 you know, appreciate that? Yeah. So one of the, there are moments in your life where the, the, the really leave an, an impact on you and, I'll tell you one story of uh, Maria in Argentina. Um, when I was working at a bank, uh, I was based in Madrid, Spain, but had a global responsibility for a, a bank that had 75 million customers, 140,000 employees. Um, and one of our businesses was Argentina. And we were looking at um, uh, the, the business we have in, uh, uh, in Argentina, wanted to build out some digital banking capabilities. They had a great branch network, they had ATMs, they had uh, uh, traditional banking, but wanted to get better at digital banking capabilities. And this is several years ago. Now, fortunately, I've, I've built mobile applications um, and some of those have been recognized as the best in the world uh, in our industry. Um, and one key element for building anything digital is design. And it's perhaps the most overlooked element and this goes back to the sociology lesson that I learned about human behavior and human interaction with products, human interaction with technology. Banking is about human interaction with money. Um, and, uh, and so understanding that, there was a woman, we needed to hire some designers in Argentina. And there was a woman that was working in the call center answering phones for customers that called in about their credit cards or their bank account. And uh, we created an, a, an environment that we invited employees within the company that had an interest um, to apply for this design role. This woman had created, and I created a bit of energy around entrepreneurship and we were seeking for entrepreneurs within the company to be disruptors and creators and that kind of thing. Uh, this woman had created her own uh, shoe line in Argentina, and she was the designer of shoes. She was working in a call center, so she'd learned some elements of banking. And we simply asked her if she'd like to, and she had been taking design classes on the side and had been just dreaming of this opportunity to bring it all together into a design role. 
and she, we hired her to as a entry level designer in Argentina. And when I left that company uh, three years later, she had a design team of about 15 people leading design for uh, the uh, one of the most successful banks in Latin America. And a case of where simply helping an individual realize their potential um, uh, is incredibly impo powerful. Um, and there are many, many other examples. Yeah, in, in fact, I, I think uh, there's a student who who's watching who asked a question kind of along these lines. I mean, how does, you know, this this idea of helping other people to find and, and develop their magic, to, to use their magic for the benefit of the organization, perhaps, how does that kind of inform how you identify good talent? How do you surround yourself with good people? What, what, what are a couple of your strategies for getting the right people in place? Um, I mentioned Richard Branson earlier, and not everybody subscribes to this, but Richard Branson has a 90 second rule. And that is within 90 seconds, you can read an individual. Some people, and again, this is, some people have a gift of being able to read people, the EQ. Some people have really high IQ. Some people have really high EQ. Um, and I subscribe to a view that you can get a, a decent read on an individual as to the type of individual, the type of person they are by being around them and having them. Uh, I start off every interview of any person I've ever hired, whether it's a CEO, whether it is a entry level employee in an organization. I simply start the interview by saying, tell me the Dr. Corcoran story. And they're like, well, wait, well, where do you want me to start? I don't care. <laughs> Tell me your story. And where they choose to tell their story is quite revealing. It tells about who they are, about what, what's important to them. Um, and, uh, and, and, and is one way that I have found um, is, is valuable in helping to understand individuals and how to help them, uh, how to help them achieve their magic and how to surround myself uh, with people that are going to compliment uh, me in, in leadership. So, so is it fair to say, I guess if you're giving advice to students, is it fair to say as they're preparing for their futures? Uh, I mean, I know this sounds almost rhetorical, but for, for them to kind of focus on their values, the things that they value as they, you know, as, as they're going to go out in the world and share their narrative, that's essential, you know, at this stage for them to, to really start figuring that out. Yeah, and then look at where were the, what are they good at in school? What is it that people compliment them on, right? What is it that people say, you're really good at that? Have you ever thought about that, right? Naturally, you're gonna get feedback that people are going to tell you what you're good at and, what, and where you can potentially um, uh, develop uh, because you're not good at something and embrace that, recognize it's okay that you're not good at something. It's, you don't have to be great at everything, um, but find those areas those spikes where you are brilliant at something or you aspire to be brilliant at something. And if you aspire to be brilliant or great or excellent at something, then what's the first step there? My father-in-law says uh, a job begun is almost half done. <laughs> I think she's just getting started. Almost, I think she said something similar, but yeah, that's a, that's a, it's that's just a good getting started. It, it's getting it out of it's getting it out of the talk and take that first step that first level of commitment because it's only one step so you know you've as, as you've indicated and uh, um, and and as, as you've kind of talked about I mean you've been all over the world since you left uh, since you left Aggieville here in in Logan Utah Um and uh, I mean, you've returned to the U.S. now, but you, uh, you know, you were in London. I mean, you worked for Barclays. Uh, you worked for BBVA when you were in uh, Madrid. Um, you worked for U.S. Bank. Now you're 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 at Google. I'm I'm kind of curious about a couple of things relative to uh, you know your your circuit uh, through all of these uh, locations. First of all. Um, you know, you've worked with a, a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds and, you know, you went to snow and you went to Utah state. 
What is it? And and I, I found this as well as I, you know, as I went to graduate school myself, but I'm wondering what your reflections are about this. Uh, what is it that allows somebody who, uh, who comes from Utah State to compete with anybody anywhere and to contribute wherever they are? I mean, uh, because I think you and I both know that, you know, Utah State gives you great preparation for the world. Absolutely. But, but just, just, Share your thoughts about that. I mean, obviously at Google now, you're working with a lot of people who are educated on the coast. Uh, what is it that allows, you know, an Aggie to compete with, with anybody anywhere? Can I tell you something really cool? Right, right after I joined Google, I was in a meeting. And uh, shortly after um, the meeting, while I'm in the meeting, I get a ping from a guy by the name of Royal Hansen. And Royal Hansen is the chief information security officer for Google. Google is a technology company. There are not many more important jobs than cybersecurity for Google. And, and uh, Royal pings me and says, hey, I see you're an Aggie. Royal knows Utah, was educated here. And he connected me via our internal chat to say, uh, to say, welcome, welcome to Google. And, uh, and there are lots of examples of, uh, individuals that have been educated in Utah, educated at Utah state. We've got an incredible alumni network. It really comes down to a belief that you are and have, you are incredible and that you have magic and that you can realize your potential. You just have to decide. Do you want to stay in Utah and live the incredible outdoor experience that I'm re reliving now and loving every minute of it being back in Utah? Do you want to go experience the world? Because you can do it. Anybody can do it. It's just finding the steps to do that. One of the greatest lessons I learned is the importance of mentors and how mentors can open doors. I'll give you an example of, uh, of that. And that is I had always been fascinated by international business. But I grew up in Ephraim, Turkey Town, Sampy County, Utah. My friends were farmers or educators. There isn't a lot of big business in Ephraim, Utah. But I remember walking across Snow College campus and, and just having this feeling, this, thing, this, this thought that I really wanted to do international business, but that's what they do in the movies, right? You see that in the movies, right? And, um, and, and yet, uh, I, I took this job back in the East Coast, and there was a there was a woman, Jocelyn Stewart, who was my boss, my boss's boss, and she believed in me. She saw my potential and actually told me that. Um, and and so I went to her and I said, "Listen, you know, I've always dreamed of doing international business, and this bank had just opened up an international division in the United Kingdom and the and Canada." There are only six people in this team. And I said, I'd love to be able to do anything. I don't care what it is. I just want to get into international business. I walked out of her office. She sends a note to the CEO of that division. The next thing I know, two days later, I'm working in the international business because she opened a door for me. She opened a door that I couldn't necessarily open the door. You know, many of us learn the principle of open your mouth share the concepts of what you believe of what you of who you are share that with your trusted friends find a mentor and then and then they'll help open doors and there were three or four times where those doors have opened that i didn't even know were that that were, were were potential um in my career that have been surprises and then embrace it when it does open did, did you, did you have a mentor? Did you feel like you had a, uh, any mentors like that at Utah state when you were a student here? Yeah, I, I, I would say, um, uh, some of my advisors in, uh, the fraternity I was in as well as, uh, the student alumni association, I mentioned Patty and Carlos were great mentors, right. uh, to me and, 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 uh, and, uh, and my sociology professor. So how, how would you recommend that students identify a mentor I, either here, you know, during their student experience or, you know, as they go out into the world of employment, either through internships or their, their first jobs? I mean, how, how do you, how do you, how do you 
put yourself out there, you know, you, you, you said, you know, open your mouth. So in other words, you have to kind of put yourself out there and be vulnerable, but how, how do you, how do you actually kind of identify uh, a mentor and, and, and solicit their, their help and advice? Um, uh, a very good friend of mine, a very successful entrepreneur said he's amazed at how approachable any individual is if you simply open your mouth and contact them. You'd be surprised if you send a letter or an email to an executive of a company, you'll be surprised how, might, how many might be open to having a conversation with you. And so, but, and that, that's one part, is identify who, do you, who would you love to have as a mentor? What are you looking for in way of a mentor? But then the most valuable part is building trust. And who, where do you have that chemistry? And because it's one thing to get insights from an, an individual, whether it's Elon Musk or somebody that you may not have any relationship with and you can get some uh, insights from, from them, uh, but to have a regular relationship where they really understand you and can be your coach and guide, that comes down to chemistry and, and, and building that chemistry and trust over time. Do you, uh, do, do you have any experiences, uh, you know, you, you've been all over the world and, and I, I think you've met some people who are obviously very well known, but do you have any anecdotes about somebody who is actually surprisingly approachable when you, when you actually kind of open your mouth uh, with, with? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So just uh, quickly, uh, uh, Dr. Corcoran, because I don't think I've explained it. I went to the, my short history was left Utah State, moved to, moved to the East Coast, was in Wilmington, Delaware for 10 years because that's actually where the payments and banking uh, part of banking that I did. That was, that was the capital there. We started two internet banks there, the first internet bank in the world, Wingspan, and then a second one, we raised $20 million from Bill Gurley at Benchmark Capital and it's created this business, sold it to Barclays. I told my wife, we'd, let's go across the pond for, for, for six months. She was a Utah State grad. We married four years after I graduated from Utah State. We had two kids at the time, moved across the, to, to London because we'd sold this business and I wanted one of the original members of the team to cross the pond and take entrepreneurial thinking into this British bank. So. We said, okay, let's go for six months. We just bought a house in Delaware, just graduated from business school. And I said, let's go for six months. Let's go experience Europe. Six months turned into 14 years. Two years in London, four years in Dubai. Uh, our third child was born in Dubai. Five years back in London, our fourth child was born in London. Three years in Madrid. And then at our 20th anniversary, my wife said, I want one thing. I want to move home. So we moved home and now we're home back here in the United States. But um, the example that I will give is our time in Dubai. And my wife actually tells this story better than I can, but it was an, it was an amazing cultural experience. So um, my father-in-law and my wife, my wife was a state rodeo champion in cow cutting and competed in nationals and has all the belt buckles to show it. And, um, and so when my father-in-law, uh, stereotypical, farmer he's a dentist but a farmer um uh and uh and incredibly successful um but he's a very uh very much a cowboy and so he comes to dubai wearing his wranglers and cowboy boots and i said um uh glenn let's 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 how, well, what do you think about going and checking out camel racing so we went to the camel races and um and we pulled up and at the camel races you just pull up your uh, uh, we pulled up our, our, our Toyota SUV and you sit on the hood and you watch the camels race by. Right at the end of the races, there's a gentleman in the, in the local dress across the, across the track, sees our little kids with the blonde hair uh, sitting up on, on top. Uh, here we're in Dubai in the Middle East. And he, and he said, shouts across the track from his white BMW X5. He shouts across the track and he says, hey, would you kids like to come see my camels? yeah that'd be cool we got a local one to show us the camels let's go let's go back to the camels so we pull back around into what what was not just the camel the camel stalls but was a compound and we pulled back into this compound and there were over 100 camels and long story short the gentleman that invited us back there ends up being a member of the royal family of uh of the united air uh, of, of dubai the maktoum family and he and my father-in-law just totally hit it off. 
this American cowboy talking to an Arab in the in the Middle East talking about camel racing and comparing that to horses and his and, and their passion for for livestock. Um, and it was an incredible cultural experience. Uh, the the um, connections then carried on uh, beyond that. That's awesome. Um, uh, if you don't mind me asking, I know that you travel a little bit, uh, a little bit with Boris Johnson, who, <laughs> of course, now the Prime Minister of Great Britain. So I'm wondering, can can you share a good Boris Johnson story with us? I, I mean, just just in short, you can uh, you can fill in the details better than me. But you were were traveling kind of as a uh, as an advisor and promoting London as a tech hub. And so part, so, so you had some brushes with Boris Johnson when he was the mayor of London. I'm just wondering if you have a good Boris Johnson story to share with us. Yeah, when we were living in London, our second stint in the United Kingdom, I was uh, very active in the um, uh, startup ecosystem, uh, the fintech ecosystem, in, and um, served on, uh, was ultimately a, a, a appointed by Boris Johnson to be a technology ad 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 advisor. Um, an ambassador for uh, the United Kingdom and, uh, and for London uh, in particular. Boris was the mayor of London at the time. He wasn't prime minister at the time. Right. He was the mayor of London. And as mayor of London, he would do some, we did a, a bunch in the UK, but we did travel uh, around the world for trade missions because the London brand is actually bigger than the UK brand. Uh, and so we would build the London brand by traveling to different parts around the world. And we did trips to Boston uh, and a couple of trips to the United States, to Singapore, to Israel and other locations. Um, and the, the most amazing thing about Boris Johnson is we talked about the gift of humor. And you talk about running a room, they call it. Whether it's running a room of cabinet ministers or running a room of thousands of people or speaking to 150 uh, 150 people in a room. That man has a gift of, you know, he has the hair to go with it and the way he does that. And he has this, he has this persona and gift of humor, but he has an intellect that is unrivaled, unrivaled. And most people, so many people don't give him credit for it, but I'll give you an example. We, we brought a, a group of, uh, and we were in, we were in New York. We brought together New York fashion and London fashion together in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a night where filled with the most beautiful people in the world, the models and the people of the fashion industry. And Winter was there and others. And Boris proceeded, he does all of the research himself on all of his speeches. And he goes into, he talks to his audience. He understands intimately who his audience is and how to talk to them. He has the same 10, 20, 40 jokes after you've heard him speak a hundred times. You hear the same jokes over and over again, but he knows where to lace them. But he knows who his audience is and who he's talking to. And in this address to the fashion industry, and he doesn't know a lot about the fashion industry, but he goes out and researches it. And he speaks about the history of British fashion and American fashion laces it with humor, but tied to history, because he's a historian, he's written books on Churchill and others, and is viewed as one of the experts on Churchill. He leverages his magic, which is a historian, with humor and running a room to speak to an audience to where he, you feel like he's talking to you and that you're just sitting there with your pal having a great time and he's cracking jokes with you. That must have been an incredible experience. I mean, especially looking back now and realizing, well, you know, now he's the prime minister. I mean, that makes it even more, um, that that me makes it even, uh, must, must make in retrospect even more um, uh, crazy to think about. You're, you're spending time with him on the road. Um, uh, just just a, a shout out to the students. Um, thanks again for participating. We're going to start winding this down in the next few minutes. So I've, 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 ask some questions the students have presented kind of as we've gone along, but if you students out there have any other questions that, uh, that you'd like to ask, make sure you get those in quickly because we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be uh, like I said, winding this down soon. Well, let me uh, get to kind of what you're doing now with Google. Um, one student asked a question, you know, when, when we're kind of having that discussion about finding your magic earlier, 
Um, tell us now, you know, in terms of your responsibilities at Google, uh, how is it that you've been able to connect and create at Google so far in, 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 in terms of what your current kind of responsibilities are? Yeah, sure. Um, so I took this role at Google because I can connect and create. And I stepped off of a path of being a CEO of a large financial institution uh, to connect and, and create. Um, so let me just tell you just a teeny bit about Google as, as, as context. Everybody knows the brand Google and knows a little bit about Google. But there's, if you peek behind the curtain just a little bit about it, there is, and to dimension Google, there are really two, two, if you boil it down to it, there are two primary assets of Google. The first is what we call the, the consumer or the ecosystem business. And that business has over 3 billion users, almost half the planet, uh, interacting with Google in some way, shape, or form every day. There are hundreds of millions of businesses that operate and connect with Google in some way in the Google ecosystem. There are nine products, businesses, or platforms within this consumer business that have over a billion users. Nine businesses with over a billion users. That's everything from Chrome and Android and, and, and uh, uh, Photos, Maps, and others are all run as individual platforms but connected in this ecosystem. Um, and about 30% of the world's internet traffic goes through uh, 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 Google. Sorry, my screen just went out again. Um, uh, so the, that, that's the ecosystem business. Now, the technology that underpins that ecosystem business is, is, is the second asset. And that technology, like the artificial intelligence that identifies that, that Chris is Chris and that Derek is Derek, that in photos to be able to identify that, that artificial intelligence is part of what is called Google Cloud. Now, many of you are familiar with Amazon and Amazon Web Services and uh, uh, Microsoft Azure maybe, but it's technology of the cloud that instead of everybody having to own their own hard drive computer, you can buy that computing capability from the cloud as, a, as an example. And the artificial intelligence that powers Google um, it can be brought to life. So let me just give you an example of how I'm able to connect and create. One of these businesses is the photo business that is in the consumer business. The artificial intelligence I mentioned that identifies Chris is Chris, Derek is Derek, chicken is chicken, cat is cat. Uh, that artificial intelligence, you take that artificial intelligence and one thing you realize is banking is trying to move in from traditional banking into digital banking is that there's still a lot of paper in banking. You still have to fill out a lot of paper and sign a lot of paper. So if you take the artificial intelligence from photos and you point that at paper, you can take and convert the paper from unstructured data into data, decisionable data, so a human never has to fill out a piece of paper again. And in my job, I get I coming into Google, people ask me what it's like. The best way to describe it is the way I felt when I was a nine-year-old kid walking into King's Variety Store in Tremont, Utah, when I visited grandpa, and he'd give me those five bucks and I and he'd say, you can have anything in the store. And I'd sit there and I'd be like, I was overwhelmed with the amazement of what was there in candy and toys. Because the toys and the candy, the capabilities, the technologies are here in Google. And I get to take those capabilities. I get to connect with the people that have created those technologies. I get to work with people that created Android. I get to work with people that created Chrome. I get to sit with them and say, okay, we're going to take that that we built in Google and we're going to offer that to banks now to help them transform. So I get to then create capabilities and we've done this to take focusing on mortgages. And yeah, you can take the 180 pages in a mortgage document that someone has to sign. If you ever buy a house, you'll have to sign a document of 130 times, signature or initial. We're gonna crush paper out of the industry and just make it digital. That's one example. That, that, that would be fantastic. Having just gone through a mortgage refinance, yeah, I have to say that that would be incredible. So, thank you, great example, and and thank you for the Kings reference. I, I remember the Kings and Logan was down next to the the Smiths, the the Smiths that's kind of I, yeah. I guess, on on Fifth East or or whatever. But anyway, yeah, that was a great store. I miss it. 
Um, you know, in terms of being on the international stage, I mean, I, I think I think a lot of us feel this way, you know, when we get to the age that you and I are at and, and we look back and we see that, yeah, we made purposeful decisions along the way, but at the same time, there were things that were kind of unexpected that happened in terms of the development of our careers. But um, if, if a student has an ambition to kind of work on the international stage, I, I think it's probably fair to say that you never thought, you know, in your own life that, you know, you would you would wind up in, in London and Dubai and Spain and so on. But if a student has that ambition, what kind of advice would you give, would, would you give to them? The first advice I, I would give is don't worry about what your degree is. It doesn't matter what your degree is. As someone that hires, some, some in organizations may worry about that, but exactly whether you have the perfect degree or not, don't worry about that. You get a great education, learn, Focus on learning more than your grades, learn and learn subjects and topics that resonate with you. That's the first thing. And be passionate about what you're learning and be able to tell why you chose what you wanted to learn. The second is Utah's exploding right now. And there are so many companies in Utah that are going global. That's one opportunity. Go Ryan's business, Ryan Smith's business, Qualtrics. That's the case study right now of how you take a business and how you go, how you can go, but look at what Ryan did. He spent invested 18 years here in the, in the United States building up Qualtrics. And then eventually he had, had such an amazing product, the customers all over the world wanted to be part of it. There's opportunities to work for the Qualtrics of the world, for Josh James's business Domo, uh, and any of these other companies that are down in, in, in Silicon Slopes. Or there are other businesses like um, uh, in Logan, uh, that have international uh, uh, businesses. My suggestion is find a business that has uh, international operations today. Get a job domestically with them because the likelihood of you getting a job uh, from Utah State into, uh, into another country, unless you speak the language and have experience in that country, may be difficult. So the first step I would suggest is find a business that has international operations start in their domestic business, and then extend into international. That's how I started. I started in First USA J JP Morgan's business, said I wanted to get into international, that opened a door, and then uh, it went from there. Thanks so much. Um, just a couple quick questions before we close up because our, our hour's almost done. Uh, one is, uh, you know, a, a big theme uh, during your, uh, during the kind of the evolution of your career has been digital transformation. And certainly with, you know, the circumstances we find ourselves in now uh, is, is we're hopefully kind of coming out of the pandemic. Uh, we're, we're at the other end of it. Uh, what, I, I guess, uh, what are some of the lasting changes that you think uh, are, are, are coming out of the experience we've had for the last year? Um, may, maybe changes for the better, you know, in terms of digital transformation. What, what do you what do you kind of see on the horizon? Uh, there's a couple of trends that we see, and that, and again, it comes back to my sociology background, and then uh, human uh, centered design, ethnographics, working with IDEO, the industrial design firm, which is one of the best in de design firms in the world, um, and, and uh, a couple of principles that uh, that are emerging out of it. The first is what I and we refer to as 100% DIY. The ability for you to be able to do what you want to be able to do when interacting with any business or any, any company, any organization, the trend is that you can do it all on this in a couple of taps. And why it making it available for you to be able to do everything on this People are now, COVID has accelerated the need. And I'll just give you an example. The top 50 reasons why Dr. Corcoran would walk into a physical branch in a bank. Those top 50 reasons before COVID, the average around banks around the world was around 50 to 60% of what you'd want to be able to do to buy a product, to sell a product, to, would, was available with a couple of taps on this device. As a result of COVID, that's changed dramatically and is closer to 65, 70% uh, around the world. And is the, the best in the world is about 96, 97% of anything you'd want to be able to do, you can do on this, that's one. 
The second is the concept of what we're doing here today. And that is a shared glass experience of being, a, it's fundamentally changed the way people work. It's fundamentally changed the way bankers interact with customers because you, you don't, people don't physically go to a, an office or a branch as much anymore. So this capability of uh, a Google Meet uh, capability sitting on top of a complex transaction or interaction where you can bring up a document, share a document, actually sign the document, execute the, uh, the interaction with the customer is, is, is another, uh, another major trend. And it all comes back to how human behavior has changed. And that human, that intersection, which is what fascinates me, the hu intersection between human interaction, technology, and some kind of product. In banking, that product is money or a financial product. In retail, it's a physical product. In travel, it's travel. And it's that how do humans buy, make decisions, and interact with technology? And how can technology change business models and change and enhance uh, customer interactions? Thank you so much. And, and I'll end, uh, I'll end on, on kind of a, a less formal question because you said that when you left Utah State, you weren't married, but you yeah. ended up marrying an Aggie. So I guess that begs the question, how did you meet your wife? <laughs> how did that happen? Boy, is that a good question. This, this brings us full circle. Up. This brings <laughs> us full circle because I mentioned I started working with a student alumni association. That led to my job. That took me back to the East Coast. Right. What well, brought me back to Logan while I was at the student alumni, working with the student alumni association, I started a golf tournament to bring for a homecoming golf tournament to bring students and alumni together to try and get people jobs. I didn't realize I was creating a marketplace at the time. I just thought we'd, I thought it'd be fun to play around a golf, right? Uh, and meet some people. So I flew back to play in that golf tournament. I'd been out of school for three years. Um, and I was a bald Mormon single bald Mormon guy living on the East Coast. Every time I came home to Utah, family was trying to set me up. And this was that weekend when I said, no, I'm hanging with my buddies. It was homecoming weekend and midnight madness for basketball. Same weekend, right? So I show up at the a football game and I'm hanging out with my former fraternity brothers. We're at the football game and this girl starts bouncing around the crowd. And uh, she knew my fraternity brothers. My fraternity brothers made an introduction. And uh, I was kind of that mindset. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not, not looking at this time. But that's, we met at the football game. We ended up hanging out the whole rest of the day. Went to Midnight Madness. I moved back to, uh, moved back to the East Coast. I called her every single day except for one. And I sent her flowers on the day I, 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 I missed. We met October uh, 15th, I believe it was. Still have the ticket from the football game. Uh, we were engaged December 23rd and married in May. Because once I knew that she was the one, and it's been 23, 20, 21 years, 22 years since. That's awesome. Great story. I'm glad that even though you ended up on the East Coast right out of school, you still ended up with a, a fellow Aggie. That's 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 great. Hey, uh, Derek, thank you so much. We, we so much appreciate you spending this time with us today. It's been, you know, I've, I've heard great things about you ever since I moved into the school um, because I, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, you've spent some time with, uh, with some students as they've, they've gone abroad to study from the Huntsman School. Yeah, you know, it's been a blast hosting groups of uh, Aggies in Dubai, in London, uh, in Madrid, and being able to show students that are traveling abroad what life could be. And now that I'm back in Utah, just an hour south of, uh, uh, of Logan, I hope to be able to spend a lot more time with Utah State and giving back to what the university gave to me. Yeah, that would be fantastic. I, I was in the math department here at USU for you know 20 years before I moved over to the Huntsman School. And uh, not long after I came over here, Liz Allred with the study abroad program just said really glowing things about you and said, you know, to me, given that you're taking over this department, which is now data analytics information systems, you got to meet Derek White. So this has been just such a pleasure for me to be able to talk to you. And 
and, and meet you today. And uh, I've, I've learned a lot uh, from what you said about, uh, you know, uh, how we can, how we can kind of better prepare students, how students can prepare themselves, but just, just been a total pleasure. And thank you to John and Jill um, from uh, the team at Huntsman for helping out with this and helping to broker this. Uh, we really appreciate it and hope you guys have enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Derek.